Tonight we're going to be talking about the first day of the ceasefire taking effect between Lebanon and Israel, the vibes that are coming from Lebanon, what's happening internally in Israel, what's going to happen with Gaza, especially with comments coming from senior figures inside of Israel that are linked to the sides that are opposing to have a ceasefire with Gaza. Uh, alongside the statements coming from Russia about targeting certain NATO bases inside of Europe. But we're going to start off, of course, with the main thing. The ceasefire came to effect today between Israel and Lebanon, and many Lebanese are seen going back to their homes and celebrating in the streets following their victory over Israel, the Israeli defeat in Lebanon, humiliation, left without accomplishing any of their objectives and with their people being unable to go back to the north, like Benjamin Netanyahu stated previously, when all of the Lebanese were going back to their homes and villages in the southern suburb of Beirut, Al-Dahi al Janubiya, and also in the southern parts of Lebanon. So, People uh, were going back in numbers that Israel did not expect. Uh, Israel found it surprising that so many people are going back, especially to the southern areas. Israel destroyed many homes in the southern part of Lebanon. But people are going back. People are going back despite that. And despite some Israeli presence in those areas, going back to Be Beirut, going back to South Lebanon, celebrating, and finally returning to their homes. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Israel is of course trying to downplay everything when it comes to the accomplishment of Hezbollah, stating things like we destroyed their biggest uh, missile bases and you know their, their celebrations are fake, alongside many other statements coming from, well, uh, mainstream media, some mainstream media and some people uh, who are leading figures inside of the Israeli establishment. But what we can see is evident, people going back south, some of them blatantly supporting the resistance as well. And uh, Israel is still based in some of those locations. Now, th there were no significant, if you, if you want to call them breaches, uh, of the ceasefire, the only things that were reported today in South Lebanon were that some tanks w were shooting like warning shots at anyone trying to come close to them in the certain areas where they are still present in, in South Lebanon, although Israel already started to withdraw from three villages in South Lebanon, despite the fact that the agreement that they had gives them 60 days to withdraw from Lebanon. But the fact that you have these uh, military brigades and units uh, that belong to the occupying genocide entity withdrawing from now indicate how much they were exhausted by this battle, how much they've suffered, how much uh, they have this defeated mentality of not wanting to remain in Lebanon following uh, so much suffering and so many of their tanks gone, some of their, of their soldiers gone and how much uh, Hezbollah inflicted damage on them. Hezbollah declared that they killed at least 130 uh, Israeli soldiers in the ground battles, wounding over 1,250, destroyed over 70 Merkavas, alongside, of course, other, other uh, targetings as well. These numbers do not include the damage inside of the occupied territories and how many were killed inside the bases that Israel targeted inside occupied uh, Palestinian territories, but only in the South Lebanon battles where Israel actually invaded. So celebrations coming in uh, Lebanon. Meanwhile, in Israel, oh, we're having lots of problems in, uh, in Israel. One of the most telling uh, statements came from this man who is the uh, chairman of, of a northern Israeli village called Margaliot. Margaliot was one of those areas that declared uh, their independence at one point from the state of Israel. He came 
on uh, Israeli television and he had this interview with them. Let's watch it and then we will go to the statements coming from more senior figures uh, inside of Israel. פה ממשלת ישראל עושה את הדברים בידיעה. ממשלת ישראל באה ומוסרת את תושבי הצפון לידי החיזבאללה. ממשלת ישראל כבר הכריזה היום על מלחמת לבנון הרביעית. ממשלת ישראל שולחת אותנו לגורלנו. ממשלת ישראל... מעולם לא הייתה הפקרות כזאת. אם כל הזמן דיברו על אהוד ברק בשנת 2000 שהוא ברח מלבנון, פה זה הפקרות ש... שלא הייתה כדוגמתה, זה פשע לעשות את זה לתושבי הצפון. לא יכולים לעשות דבר כזה לתושבי הצפון, לשלוח אותם כלעומת שהם באו. מה זה יתר כבשים? לשחיטה? לאן ביבי רוצה להביא אותנו? כל תושבי הצפון, הצטרפתי אתמול בבתי מלון, שלשום בבתי מלון, אנשים באבל. מה קורה פה? ביבי, תבוא, תשאל עם ראשי הוועדים, ראשי מועצות, עם ראשי היישובים. מה זה פה, מדינה של איש אחד? תעצור רגע! לאן אתה רץ? שנה וחודשיים טובחים בנו, שנה וחודשיים הורגים בנו, שנה וחודשיים מפרקים אותנו, והיום אתה בא ורץ לחתום על כל נייר שלא יהיה, העיקר להשיג את הצבא מלבנון? So this is basically the head of the Margaliot settlement in the north that, like I said, they, they declared that they actually cut their ties with the state at one point when there were more people talking about uh, independence of the northern part from the central government after uh, what they said, the neglect. After the neglect coming from the Israeli government against them, they are not able to go back. and Hezbollah are targeting them every day. So they're very frustrated with uh, what's happening, especially with the fact that you have the Lebanese being able to go down to their uh, villages back south in Lebanon, whereas the Israelis are not able to go back to the northern parts of Israel. That is for at least the initial phase of the ceasefire, which is 60 days. And these 60 days are very telling. Yesterday we were talking about the fact uh, that Hezbollah could have potentially added this as a condition, in effect to continue the pressure on Israel, albeit without direct targeting, as in direct missile launching or fighting between them and Israel, because this is what it leads to. Uh, internal fighting and this criticism is not only coming from this man this criticism is coming from many inside of the uh, Israel establishment so one of these people was of course uh, Itamar Ben Gvir Itamar Ben Gvir he had uh, an interview with the Israeli channel 14 but this is in Hebrew, I'll tell you, uh, you know, brief details about what happened in this uh, interview. Firstly, Channel 14 in Israel is a channel that belongs to the extreme uh, right wing in Israel. So it supports Netanyahu, it supports Ben Gvir, it supports the settlement, supports continuing the war, it supports expanding the war, it supports... Uh, Israel controlling de facto the West Bank and Gaza and expanding to Lebanon. It supports you know, everything that they want, you know, the, the greater Israel. The uh, ultra-right-wing ideology inside of, um, of Israel. They were talking for the first time about the uh, prospect of a ceasefire in Gaza all of a sudden. Where is this talk coming from? This uh, channel is supposed to be a channel that supports uh, Netanyahu, supports expanding the war, and these figures inside of his cabinet. So they were asking uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, why did you, uh, why are we now in a ceasefire in Lebanon? He was like, I, I opposed this ceasefire in Lebanon. He was the only man who voted against the ceasefire in Lebanon, but the, the rest of the cabinet members agreed to a ceasefire. He, he was saying, uh, I, I find it uh, unfortunate that I was the only person who uh, voted against a ceasefire in uh, Lebanon. But you know that that's the situation we have now in Lebanon. 
And I'm not going to leave the government. I'm not going to leave the government and I'm going to kind of continue the pressure. Although this man previously said, I'm going to resign if we have a ceasefire with Lebanon. He said it outright. If we have a ceasefire with Gaza, I will resign. He said, if we have a ceasefire with Lebanon, I will resign. All of a sudden, he's not resigning. Mm -hmm. So what, we, what we're what we starting to see here is, in fact, an implementation of, you know, what I was speaking about a couple of months ago about Netanyahu using this potentially to try and climb down the ladder, depending on how far uh, he goes. And now, well, they have a ceasefire in Lebanon. So uh, he was asked, well, now you have a ceasefire in Lebanon. Why, why, why don't you have a ceasefire with Gaza, isn't it time now to have a ceasefire with Gaza? Uh, this is what the channel is saying. Again, an unusual tone coming from them. And he's saying, oh no, Gaza is different. You know, it's not the same. Uh, Gaza is a bigger thing. Uh, and we need to continue. Well, you said the same thing about Lebanon. We need to continue up until we eliminate Hezbollah. We need to continue up until this and that. And eventually, <clears throat> you're still in a government that had a ceasefire with Lebanon. First and foremost, because of the level of fierce resistance coming from Lebanon against Israel. That's uh, number one. But there are many other contributors to that too. But the main thing is the fact that Israel is still getting a beating and suffering internally from what's been, inflicting, been inflicted upon them uh, by the resistance. Defeated uh, mentality, the person himself is getting criticism, Benjamin Netanyahu is getting criticism like the man that I showed you before, the vibe coming from the people, what are we doing here, whether they humiliated us, uh, the opposition again criticizing, all of the opposition almost criticizing Benjamin Netanyahu about how much of a shameful <clears throat> submission agreement they're calling him, a submission agreement to Lebanon it is, Benny Gantz, people in the military or were in the military, well, Benny Gantz himself, he was the chief of staff, the other man who was the chief of staff who, and who was previously a member of the war cabinet, Gadi Eisenkot, he also criticized the ceasefire with Lebanon heavily as well. So we're having a clear picture here of who won and who lost in this confrontation with Lebanon, at least since the escalation. Because before Hezbollah declared we were a supporting front with limited attacks on Israel up until they have a ceasefire with Gaza, up until we reach the stage where, uh, and Hezbollah were, were of course trying to avoid uh, reaching an all-out war with Lebanon. They succeeded with that up until uh, two months back. This came simultaneously with the increased pressure internally on Benjamin Netanyahu. So he had to escalate so that he can take away some of that uh, pressure so that people can start focusing on uh, Lebanon, sending five divisions up north, you know, enough divisions to go into what? Central Lebanon. But well, almost the same number of the Lebanese army, the whole of the Lebanese army. They have about 80, 90,000 soldiers in uh, Lebanon. Five divisions of Israel consisted of over 60, 65,000 armed uh, soldiers for uh, the Geno state. Uh, so they faced a massive humiliation from uh, Lebanon. And now, now they are well, at least to the media that is supportive of Netanyahu, of su supportive of this man, now they are slowly trying to talk about the prospect of a ceasefire with Gaza. As It's as if, it's as if everything is already arranged and understood, but there are certain steps to be taken up until we reach that stage so that Israel is not seen to be as the country accepting all of a sudden a ceasefire with Lebanon and a ceasefire with Gaza at the same time without achieving any of their military objectives because it would be looking like a much bigger failure than what it is already looking for. Israel by the evidence on the ground, by the fact that we are still having uh, resistance against Israel from Gaza and from other, other fronts too, and by the fact that they are struggling very much internally. So the 
So we have that, of course, when it comes to Lebanon. But the war in Gaza hasn't officially stopped. The war in Gaza is still there. Today, they, there were several uh, interviews on a couple of uh, Arab media networks with people from Gaza asking them, what do you think about the ceasefire? in Lebanon. And all of the people were saying, we congratulate that, that's a great thing for Lebanon, and we hope that the thing is implemented in, in uh, Gaza as well. None of them had any sort of negative talk or anything to say. They said Lebanon was the first country to participate and help us. They sacrificed so much for us. They deserve a ceasefire. However, we also deserve a ceasefire too now. And it looks like this might be where things are heading again, even if it it might be short-lived or even if it's for a limited amount of time because the scale of what happened in the past year is uh, unlike any phase in the history of Israel previously. So we still have Israel committing crimes. In Gaza, they had an attack on a five-story building in Beit Lahia housing, uh, women and children, I mean refugees. And uh, reports said that over 100 martyrs from that attack on, on Beit Lai. That's in the northern part of Gaza. So they are still uh, targeting the innocent civilians, trying to apply more pressure on them and uh, taking all of their uh, sadism. I mean, what, what Israel is doing is sadistic. It's pure sadism. You're talking about a, a psychopathic state that uh, finds pleasure in the uh, torture and suffering of other people. And that's why they are uh, trying to inflict as much damage on these people already suffering, innocent people, uh, through this genocide and mass starvation campaign. But despite all of that, are unable to touch the Palestinian resistance. And I mean, we were talking about uh, Beit Lahia. This was a video coming from Al Qassam brigades in Beit Lahia. That's one of the most northern parts of Gaza, by the way. One of the most northern parts in Gaza. Targeting um, machinery and tanks of Israel with their. Uh, own produced Yassin 105 RPG launcher and RPG warhead. And they also obtained uh, one of their quadcopters uh, in Gaza too. But I, I, I mean, as we can see, the, this is the most hard, one of the most hardly hit areas in uh, in Gaza. Yet the Palestinian resistance is still able to to do that to the occupying genocide forces inside of Gaza. Netanyahu was saying that we want to continue this campaign to apply military pressure on Hamas. Of course, of course, his declared main objective is to eliminate uh, the Hamas. Uh, however, he's nowhere near that. Uh, the only thing he's doing is eliminating uh, his soldiers in Gaza in those locations that are most hardly hit. We're still having attacks on uh, the Israeli forces, occupying forces present in uh, Rafah, conducting mass terror in Rafah. 
and the Palestinian resistance is still targeting them there. Every time they have any limited invasion into one of the territories they were in before, again, on its own, a fact that indicates that they have failed in their uh, military objective against the resistance because they have to go back. Well, why do you have to go back? You have to go back because there are still people fighting and you haven't taken away any of the uh, pressure against you when it comes to uh, the armed resistance. And of course, that you are implementing in terms of Israel, a campaign of ethnic cleansing. That's the main thing you want to do, a campaign of ethnic cleansing and destruction against the Palestinian people. And even with that, you're failing. People are still, even in Gaza, despite, the, again, despite all of the beyond uh, uh, horror scenes that are happening in, in uh, North Gaza, deciding to remain in the North, deciding to remain in the North. So we're seeing something happening. We have more talks coming from figures in the pal on the Palestinian side that there are talks, there are indeed talks about a ceasefire in Gaza, but the Palestinian resistance is outright refusing, refusing any ceasefire that won't include ending the war, a complete ceasefire, withdrawing, uh, the, the Israeli genocide terror forces withdrawing from Gaza, alongside their other main conditions, allowing all of the people back everywhere in Gaza, then getting all of the aid in, and then of course rebuilding Gaza. The Palestinian resistance, from their perspective, there are no halfways. They've tried this halfway before, it didn't work, Israel restarted the war, they don't wanna put the Palestinian people in the same position again from their perspective if we do have a ceasefire it has to be a concrete ceasefire and again that position does not come from a side that is being defeated that position doesn't come from a side that is weak that position comes from a side that is winning that is brave that is heroic in confrontation and is willing to sacrifice and that's what we're seeing because there were several offers on the table that would include, you know, a limited ceasefire, but again, nothing for the Palestinians. And only that, uh, you know, some of these uh, prisoners of war, uh, they need to be released. And that's something that the Palestinian side is not going to be accepting. Which leads me to, well, I just wanted to share one thing with you before I go to the, to the uh, uh, last point. You see, uh, there are many people who talk about, you know, uh, the Judeo-Christian nation, right? The Judeo-Christian values, you know, trying to, from a Christian perspective, uh, falsely claim that these people are God's chosen people and, you know, they are our allies and... Uh, but this is what they've been doing in Lebanon. Hmm? So we have this video being published of uh, depraved genocide soldiers going to a church in Lebanon hmm? and pretending to have a wedding. Look at this. A a a look at what they're saying. It's, it's translated in uh, in English as well. Oh, the great Mary! Oh. שם החתן, שם הקלה, הגענו לערב הזה, הגענו לערב הזה אחרי כמה זמן של זוגיות? 
So, as you can see, uh, the Israeli soldiers going to a church and, uh, of course, desecrating the church. They, they destroyed churches previously, saying, you know, it's the first wedding in the team, right, with the cross. And, uh, you yeah, know, mocking uh, Mary, peace be upon her, and uh, singing uh, like Christian so in, in as in trying to make fun out of them. And they've done, of course, uh, many things like that in, in uh, mosques as well. They destroy them, you know, on a, on a repeated basis. It just reveals the true nature of these people who, uh, you know, who some are trying to convince us are innocent, you know, peace-seeking uh, people trying to defend themselves, trying to defend themselves. What was it in the church here that was uh, threatening them? And why were they mocking it? And why do they do all of these things constantly and repeatedly, you know, mocking people in their houses and, you know, the, the weird type of behaviors, you know what I mean? That, that reflect the uh, level of sickness and sadism in these people and what they do. And that's the norm. That's the norm that the Palestinian people have been facing ever since uh, the inception of this Zionist entity uh, on the land of Palestine. Which leads me to the final thing that I wanted to share with you. I mean, we've been covering more and more about the developments when it comes to NATO and the proxy war in Europe. And now we're having more statements coming from Russia following the escalation coming from the United States and its proxies. So at this report here, uh, our team Medvedev does not rule out targeting NATO bases in Europe. Deputy Chairman of the Russian Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, said that Russia could not rule out a strike on NATO bases in European countries. But Moscow does not want this scenario. Again, echoing previous statements that we had from Russia and, and you know, previous interviews with President Vladimir Putin too, that they don't want this escalation, but that uh, the United States is constantly pushing more and more provocations and attacks and reckless attacks inside of Russian territories, including against nuclear facilities. And now we had the missiles, of course, and there's more talk about giving the uh, Ukrainian troops fighting under Zelensky more weapons to target Russia. Although we were at a phase multiple times of almost reaching a, a ceasefire, but there are some people profiteering uh, at the expense of people's lives in Ukraine. And they are, I mean, there's nothing to explain it but leading the world to World War Three. I mean, the levels of weapons being used now by Russia and these threats, they should be concerning everyone and wake people up from their, you know, apathy. There's a lot of apathy um, in Europe. There is a level of apathy. I mean, there are people who are aware of uh, what their governments uh, are doing. But in, in general, you're talking about apathy. And like, oh, you know, we don't know. And yeah, you know, the government says so, so we'll continue. And this apathy, this apathy, uh, primarily due to the fact that Europe hasn't really seen wars for the past 80 years, uh, leads people to, you know, have this false sense of confidence. Yeah, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm sure, you know, it's, it's going to be sorted eventually. Oh, no, it's all, you know. 
too dramatic or too unrealistic. No, it's not unrealistic. It's real. And it's primarily due to the United States militaristic oligarchy and its proxies and people profiteering of this war. And this is constantly escalating. And there are more reports now of European countries, well, NATO members, so NATO basically, the, the European arm of the United States administration escalating further. We had the senior figure yesterday talking about uh, business ad- businesses needing to prepare, to prepare for war, you know, have batteries and have water and what have you. And, you know, I hope you have uh, uh, plan B uh, or a nuclear cream or something <laughs> that will protect you from, from a nuclear bomb or something. And uh, we, of course, have more uh, responses coming from Russia.